There's a famous quote from geneticist J.B.S. Haldane that the creator has an inordinate fondness for beetles. <laughs> no, 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 not not that. Yeah, yeah, these. Yeah, these beetles. So <laughs> Oh, Cleveland Museum of Natural History. I see what you did there, you sneaky bastard. We're gonna have some fun today, Homo sapiens. I'm Skeptic Dank, and today we're talking about beetles and creationism. Still no theme song? I'm gonna have to work on that. Why do I brew this hooch so strong? Oh, right. Because the world is filled with idiots. Beetles, known taxonomically as Order Coleoptera, make up about 25% of all documented species. There's almost 400,000 documented species of beetle across 30,000 different genera in 176 families. In other words, nature is fucking horny for beetles. Keep in mind, this is documented species. Scientists are discovering more and more beetles all the time. According to the PNAS, or Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, which I have decided will henceforth be referred to as PNAS, there is likely one and a half million different species of beetle when you count the ones that haven't been discovered and or documented yet. I'll say it again, nature is fucking horny for beetles. Mr. Tank, what crude obscenity is this? You will cease the use of such language or be demonetized immediately! Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't realize we were in 11th century Britain. I'm sure our Norman overlords will be very displeased at my Anglo-Saxon vernacular. Go ahead and demonetize me. At the time of writing this, I had 69 subscribers. Nice. I'm not getting paid shit for this. I mean, give me a thousand subscribers. Maybe I'll start censoring myself. I mean, I'll still curse, but maybe I'll, like put some kind of little sound effect over it or something. Anyway, beetles. But today I want to talk about a specific kind of beetle. One that young earth creationists claim defies the theory of evolution. A beetle so irreducibly complex it couldn't possibly be the product of gradual evolution, supposedly. Of course I am talking about the bombardier beetle. But the bombardier beetle isn't just one species of beetle. There's actually over 500 species of bombardier beetle across 50 genera in two different subfamilies of the ground beetle family. And at this point, its diversity alone doesn't look too good for the whole the bombardier beetle couldn't be the product of evolution take. But the thing that really gets young earth creationists going about the bombardier beetle is its incredibly hot ass. Now, here to tell you more about how unbelievably hot the bombardier beetle's ass is, is none other than the young earth creationist taxation evasionist inmate number 0645201017 himself, Dr. Kent Hovind. You can get World Book Encyclopedia Science Here 81 edition and read about the bombardier beetle. They've got this beetle glued down with a drop of yellow wax on his back and a paper clip stuck in there. He's clamped into a ring stand, so he'll cooperate for the photographer. And then they reached up with the tweezers and pinched his front leg. The beetle is thinking, man, there's that ant. He's biting my leg again. Those guys never learn. This beetle has a cannon back near his hind end. He swings it around at the enemy and <laughs> blasts his enemy with 212 degree chemicals. The temperature of boiling water. Oh, oh, Kent, where have the years gone? Now, I know this is early 2000s, Kent, but he really doesn't update his material, so it doesn't really matter. Now, this is pretty much all accurate so far. Now, incidentally, I've actually been sprayed by a bombardier beetle before. It was a little one, a little bigger than a grain of rice, maybe. It landed on my neck. When I went to pick it off, I just felt a little hot sting. It was like someone heated up a paperclip and poked me with it. Similarly, Charles Darwin also wrote about a bombardier beetle that sprayed him when he put it in his mouth because, you know, of course, why not? You know, where else are you going to put it? So, Kent, tell us more about how this works. Now, where does a beetle get something 212 degrees? What's he got, a furnace back there? 
The ejection system on the Bombardier Beetle shows basic similarity to the pr propuls pulse jet propulsion mechanism of the German V-1 buzz bomb of World War II. What the Beetle has evolved is an intermittent explosive process that fires 500 pulses per second. The explosive energy comes from the mixing of two separate fluids, hydroquinones and hydrogen peroxide with oxidative enzymes. Now this part is still all correct. Notice he cited his source as a Jeffrey Dean, who is a professor of biology. Now keep an eye on what Dr. Inmate 06452-017 does in the next few slides, because he gets kind of sneaky with his citations. The fundamental question, of course, is how can many small random mutations contribute to the development of mechanisms of the pulse jet, its two fuels, the pumps, the fuel reservoirs, the control system, when only the complete perfected system has survival value? Although creationists argue that the theories of evolution and natural selection are unconvincing here, it is still possible that atheistic factors still beyond our ken are operating, and what we really need is a better theory of evolution. <laughs> That's the grasp in its draws. Now, this part was not from Jeffrey Dean, the expert. This was the author of the magazine that was using Jeffrey Dean as source material. This is William R. Corliss, and he is not an expert on bombardier beetles. Rather, he is a physicist, and he also likes to collect and publish little bits of interesting information for his science magazine. And this tone he takes of science doesn't possibly understand how this could have happened was really more of like a 1990s science magazine equivalent of being clickbaity. So let's move on. You may want to take a drink here because we are about to go full hoven. How on earth could a beetle evolve something so complex? What he's got back in his hind end, he has two compartments where he stores these chemicals, hydroquinones and hydrogen peroxide. So I want to point out here, he is no longer going from the source material from the last slide. This is where the truth gets thrown completely out the window. And this next part is 100% military grade pure bullshit. If those two get together, they explode. <coughs> They do not. That, that's just straight up not true. Richard Dawkins actually demonstrates this in an experiment, which I will link in the description. All the sources I could find on the matter say that hydrogen peroxide and hydroquinone don't really do much with each other until you add a catalyst like the oxidative enzymes that were mentioned earlier from Jeffrey Dean, the actual beetle expert here. But wait, we are not even at peak hovind yet. Now the beetle does not want them to explode in his hind end. That would be uncomfortable. So, he has another chemical that he mixes in there. It's called the inhibitor. It prevents the reaction from taking place. But now it doesn't do any good because he sprays it on his enemies and they lick it off and keep chewing off his leg. The inhibitor is not a thing. As I said, the two chemicals don't really do much without a catalyst, so there's no need to inhibit them. Now, I don't know much about hydroquinone, but I'm sure hydrogen peroxide would not be very tasty to a predator that thought it was about to munch on a tasty beetle. So to say this adaptation would be completely useless without the explosive chemical reaction is just false. It's almost as if the early transitions of these defense mechanisms were just bad tasting chemicals to deter predators. Then over time, selective pressures pushed those chemical secretions to become more and more weaponized. But anyway, continue. So he has a fourth chemical that he sprays in at the last possible second. Oh, a fourth chemical you say? Do tell. The fourth chemical neutralizes the third chemical and allows the first to explode. Is that too complicated? Yes, Dr. Inmate 06452-017. It is. Because that's too many chemicals. There's only three. There's four chemicals, the first two explode, the third one makes them not explode, and the fourth one takes away the third one, and the first two explode. Now timing is very important for the beetle. <laughs> if he forgets to put the neutralizer in, or the inhibitor in, one time, he's history. If he puts the neutralizer in too soon, he's got a problem. And this beetle, as it slowly evolved over billions of years, you would hear them exploding in the jungle as they practiced their chemistry. Now, I've seen this same bullshit argument from multiple different creationist apologist sources, which 
really gets me wondering, where are they all getting this same inaccurate information? Turns out the origins of this claim was none other than Dr. Dwayne T. Gish, the OG creationist master debater and namesake of the Gish Gallup, a dubious debate technique used by Kent Hovind and other garbage humans who try to be like him. But you will never be like him. Because even Dr. Inmate 06542-017 thinks you're an idiot, Nathan. For those of you who don't know, the Gish Gallop is when someone uses their allotted time in a formal debate to just be wrong about as many things as they possibly can in that amount of time. To where the opponent can't possibly refute everything that they were wrong about in their allotted time. And instead they can just stand mouth agape in apocalyptic awe in how fucking wrong you just managed to be. Trying to think of how to possibly explain to you how basic things work until their allotted time runs out. From what I can tell, Gish at best misunderstood how bombardier beetles work and at worst is deliberately just making shit up. But because creationists don't like to correct each other, the bombardier beetles inhibitor chemicals have still remained a common talking point among young earth creationists. But please continue, Dr. Inmate 06452-017. And they would gather together for the funeral. And Grandma would say, kids, take a look at your Uncle Herman. Look at him good, boys and girls. He blew his whole hind end right off. Do you want to die like that? No, Grandma. Well, then quit goofing off and pay attention in school. Someday we're going to be a fire-breathing beetle, you know. <laughs> well, listen, folks. If you think Bombardier Beetle evolved by chance, you need help. He doesn't know nothing about chemistry. He's never even been to kindergarten. His whole body is only that big. His brain is even smaller. All he knows is if somebody bites you, squirt them. They'll leave if they're able. <sighs> this is all very cute, but I refuse to believe that someone who has had an evolution explained to them as many times as Ken Hobine has thinks that this is how evolution works. It seems like people like Kent Hovind deliberately misrepresent evolutionary theory to their audience. It worked on me. I used to think that evolution was dumb because I was sheltered from learning about how it actually works. Then, when I actually decided to learn more about it as an adult, it was so fascinating I just binged the fuck out of people like Richard Dawkins and channels like R and Ra, Gutsick Gibbon, PBS Eons, Vice Rhino. Of course, now I see what a grifter Hovind is, but I was a fan before I knew any better. It even works on big enemies. Here's a toad about to eat bombardier beetle. Picture number two, beetle is in the toad's mouth. Picture three, beetle is back out. <laughs> and the toad's tongue is laying on the floor, and he's backing off saying, Woo, somebody call the cook. Ugh. Too many jalapenos on that one. I'm sorry, too many what, Kent? Jalapenos. Come again? Jalapenos. A blue whale has an 11 foot what, Kent? Penis. One more time, please. Penis, penis, penis. Okay, I said one more time, Kent. Don't be a child. Besides, Kent, we were just over this. It's pronounced penis. You need help. And you need to pay your taxes. So that's it for this one. This one was a lot of fun, but there's still a lot of things I wanted to go over that I didn't get to. So I'll be making a part two where we discuss beetles and their implications on the supposed created kinds and how beetles would fit into the story of Noah's Ark. I've been Skeptic Dank. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks for watching, Homo Sapiens.